When someone ghosts us, this is the first time I've, I've had to think about this, so bear with me while I do. I'm thinking that that's a very difficult situation to be in because you're being, your ego's being crushed and you are being ignored and somebody's telling you that you're not important to them and they were important to you. I believe the best thing to do if somebody is, is truly ghosting you, you know, just a, a wiping you out of their existence is to forgive them for that because it has nothing to do with you. Marty knows because my brother Marty, he's a huge ghoster. He's just dumping people all the time. And so, not true. It is true. But I think there's nothing to say to him if he's ghosting you. I think the thing is, is to bless him and remind yourself that whatever it is doesn't have anything to do with you because a, a normal person who can handle any, you know, who can handle regular relationships wouldn't hurt somebody like that. And if they did, it's because they don't know what else to do or how to handle it. So I don't know that there would be a point to any, let's say, what do you say type of tactic? I mean, what, what would be the end result? What would you want to get out of if you could, let's say, break through that, you know, poltergeist and get to the other side, get to the light? I don't know what the point would be, you know what I mean? Other than to express yourself in your own hurt, but you could do that. Sometimes I think you'd have to do that without him. So I think anybody who's been brought into our life is for a reason. And, you know, anybody who's, who's there is supposed to be there and anybody's supposed to be there is. So I think, unfortunately, sometimes we're supposed to be ghosted. And it's, maybe it's like this. <laughs> you asked, I'll tell you. I think sometimes in our life we experience that thing where we get our, we, we worship false gods. You know what I mean? We are false idols. We, we tend to find our value in other things, external things. We tend to find our value in our relationships, our dates, our friends, our money, our status, our things, our beauty, our youth, our whatever it is. And it, if we're lucky, we'll be taken away from us so that we can fall down real hard and then have to be forced to recognize and find ourselves in what we really should be finding it in. And maybe that's what's happening. You know, maybe when we are ghosted, it's because we're supposed to be ghosted. I, I wish Ghostbusters was <laughs> was a real thing. And I, I the reason I don't have an answer for that is because I, I don't, other than that, then I think that we would have to look into us and just figure out why did this happen and what does it mean to us and why are we feeling this way? Um, and I think it's because there's nothing to be done when somebody's ghosting us. What they're trying to tell us is, I don't want you in my life anymore. And so we have to accept that. Maybe you could write him or her a letter, a handwritten letter. I've done this. A handwritten letter expressing yourself and how what that meant to you. And it's not really meant for them. It's meant for you. But you can get it out because it's true. Whatever is in you is going to come out of you, which I, again, learned this morning at the doctor's office. Uh, and... It is important that if we have something in us, if it's hurt or whatever, or anger, or frustration, that we get it out or else it comes out in an unhealthy way. Speaking of Marty, um, okay, hold on one second. I have to see this. Okay. I'm starting with you, the ghosting thing. Are you ghosting? <laughs> Marty's ghosting me? Okay, guys do this all the time. They do. I know. Uh, and they know what they're doing. They Well, see, the thing is, Jessica, maybe I'm not getting this right. If you're being ghosted, you're already blocked, right? Or is it just that you're being ignored? Because I do agree with you, if you're being ghosted in the sense that I'm believing, or that I, that I believe it is, you know, where people are just, they're writing you off and not communicating with you anymore. I agree with you. I, I try to get them off your radar so that you don't have to suffer that type of abuse. Because I believe that, going into something else that somebody had a question on today, they were asking me, what do they do because their, their wife is constantly giving them the silent treatment. And what can he do? Because it's a recurring thing that keeps happening. And he said he can't go to a hotel or leave, you know, leave the situation. Because I believe that if somebody's giving you the silent treatment or whatever else, that is an abusive thing. You have to separate yourself from that situation, even if momentarily, because that's abuse. And we don't want to sit around and work through abuse. But he was saying it happens all the time. So what is he going to do? And I, I thought, well, Unfortunately, you'd have to find somebody who specializes in abuse for that. And I believe that, uh, so, so I don't know because you can't sit around and work through abuse by yourself if you're the abusee. 
And I believe that uh, if you're being ghosted, it can be a form of abuse because it's like somebody's giving you the silent treatment. And if that person was important to you, that feels just like uh, that feels just like somebody's giving you the silent treatment. They're just doing it virtually. So that is abusive. And I do agree with you. I just didn't realize that that was part of the equation. So thank you for throwing that in. <laughs> Jessica, I'm going to try to get some real glasses by the next time I'm on here. Um, his body language should tell you if he's, if he's inviting. Wow, what am I missing out on? Charles, that sounds good. Um, I agree, Charles, by the way. You know, if you, when people, I think that is the bottom line when people ghost us. Their ghosting is about them. How we react to it is about us. What we take away from that is about us. And I think that that is the most important thing to remember, really in any one of those situations. Whenever somebody is doing us wrong, abusing us, uh, you know, somehow hurting us, that is about them. But how we respond to it has nothing to do with them at all. It is all about us. And so we want to keep that in mind and use that as a foundation to however we respond and move along. Okay. Um, exactly. <laughs> Breezy. I take ghosting as a sign that they are liars. They can't keep their word. That could be, that, that could be, but also there's a lot of, you know, I don't want to, if somebody's, I, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to judge somebody, even an abuser or a ghoster. People surprise us with the reasons why they do the things that they do. And usually when we are thinking it's the worst, we tend to be wrong. You know, when, whenever we find out the true reason why people are the way they are or think the way that they think, the real reason, you know, when it comes right down to it and we learn that one thing that makes us go, are you kidding? Now I totally understand. God, I wish I'd known that, I, but I get it now. You know, I, and then we feel bad for them and we can't help but love them again because uh, that's natural. And once you really know somebody, you love them. So if you're not loving them, and if they're not loving you, it's because something's wrong. They're not seeing something correctly. They're not in the natural state because or else it would be love. That's all there is. Okay. I've had a tough day. Have you, Anthony, you've had a tough day. Let's talk it out. Okay. My boss questioned whether I'm doing my job. Hmm. This is something she's done before and it really angers me. Instead of asking me what's going on, she accuses and even compared me to others in my position. She does this in writing. I responded and I did have to defend and explain my side of it. I don't know how to react to this. Well, Anthony, I recommend, first of all, do not, do not respond in writing anymore. You, as we know, if somebody's saying nasty things in writing, chances are it's because they can't say it face to face or over the phone or they would. You know what I mean? Like my brother, he would, he's always one for picking up the phone or going up to somebody face to face because it would be the same thing either in writing or face to face. People who tend to send us nasty things in writing, they can't do it face to face. Uh, so I recommend, first of all, the next time you have to, if you have to respond to one of these ac accusations, do it in person or over the phone because chances are she, I think it's a she, will back down much more quickly. But um, I think that it's, it's, we're, we're really on a slippery slope when we're being defensive at work because work should not be personal. And if you're defending, if you're defending yourself, which sounds like, you know, you're, what, what is what's going on here? Something's wrong. She's, she's taking that relationship down the wrong path because at work, it should only be about prod, or processes, procedures, products, and it can always be discussed in the passive voice. You know what I mean? This is what happened. This policy, this procedure broke down. This, it should never be anything personal ever, 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 ever. And as soon as it becomes personal, that's where we know we're going down the wrong path and it's not going to end well because it also doesn't serve the organization, which is really what we're there to do. So I, I recommend it. If she, <laughs> I'm getting a vibe that she's, you know, the narcissist type. Now, I, I think the term narcissist is thrown out much too often these days when it's true, not true narcissism. But it sounds like uh, if you're being attacked, it does not sound like you're an insane person. Uh, and she's doing this in writing, probably because of things that she's actually done, but can't take responsibility for it. So she has to blame somebody and that's going to be you, I'm guessing. Um, I would make sure that when you talk to her about these issues, you use the passive voice and talk about 
for example, not what she accused you of, but the accusations that were made instead of she was wrong when she said that you did this. Let me clarify what happened rather than what I did. Um, for example, you sent me that email. This email was sent to me. I wish you would talk to me in, you know, instead of writing these things. Instead, I would say I prefer to be uh, addressed in person or over the phone, at least if it's an issue like this, that's going to maybe start treading into the personal territory, but let's talk about that later. You know what I mean? So I would just make sure that when you address these issues with her, you do it in person, use the passive voice because you don't want to have to blame it back on her because it's just probably going to make it worse. And I think if you do that uh, and ask her, for example, um, Trixie, I'm frustrated because I have always respected you as a professional and I'm wondering why you are taking our relationship to such a personal level and you're dragging it down into a personal level against me. Have I done something unprofessional to warrant that? Because I prefer to keep our relationship professional as we always have and I've always enjoyed it that way. Can we do that please going forward? You're know, like, if you were to school her like that, you know, and just in a very non uh, accusatory way, but using the passive voice, you know, I would appreciate it if we could keep our relationship professional as we always have. I've always enjoyed it. Have I done something that has warranted a personal attack? Because that's what I feel is happening right now. And I would like to know what it is that I did to deserve that. If you keep it professional and ask her what is the deal while you're bringing it down to such a personal level, that might trigger something in her to that would allow her to recognize what am I doing? You know, maybe she, <laughs> those are my tips for now. Uh, so I, I would absolutely make sure you, you can't ever school somebody for taking the low road if we ourselves take it. You know what I mean? So that's why I always encourage people at work to keep a very uber professional tone so that when it comes time and you need to, you can say to somebody, you know, I've always, considered our relationship to be nothing but professional. And I'm surprised that you're taking such an intimate stance with me and talking to me in such a familiar way. You know what I mean? You can only do that when you have kept it really professional up until that point. So I'm sure that you have, but maybe you want to pull back a little bit so that you can tell her, hey, I, I, I apologize if I led you to believe that we have a more intimate relationship than we do, because I prefer to keep this strictly professional and that type of language is nothing but personal. You know what I mean? So that's what I suggest you do because it sounds like you're hurt by that and you shouldn't be hurt at work. It's not about, you know, it's not personal. It shouldn't be. Um, or probably they feel powerless. Yeah, Charles. Yeah, Charles. Yeah, you're, yeah, that's right. Charles was saying that the people, that they feel weak. That's, that is, <laughs> and that's the challenge, right? Because when people feel weak at work or that they are being attacked or especially people with really weak egos um, or that I, I should say ego driven when they're really ego driven, I want to be careful to not bruise that anymore. Right. Because that just tends not to serve me. I want to, and I think this is another key while I'm talking to my boss, I want to address behavior, not people. I want to address, you know, things that happened, not to the people that did it. <laughs> you know, I want to, if I can keep it to policy and, and procedure and all of that, that's what I would do. But when it starts to be, brought down to a personal level, people tend to be afraid that somehow they're going to be exposed for the frauds that they are. You know, that's what people tend to feel like. I think most of us can relate to that. Hey, Dan, cheers from Poland. Hey, nine Yahoo. Um, thank you for, thank you for, thank you for, thank you for, I'm glad that I helped you with the haters. My brother's a hater and a spot, spotlight stealer. And he's really been a master teacher for me. <laughs> I'm joking, Mart. Um, okay. Hi, just me, Joe. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the answers too. I'm hoping they come. What do you do when you introduce two friends to each other and then they exclude you from all of the group meetings afterwards? Ah, oh, is this at work, by the way? Or is this just when you introduce two friends and all of a sudden they're good friends and, and you're out of the loop? Um, I recommend if Sophie's, Sophie's question is, I believe this is just personal and not work. If I'm wrong, tell me. I believe she's saying I introduced two friends. Now they're better friends than I am with either one of them and they're being excluded from their gatherings. If that happens, I recommend, because I've, I've dealt with this with 
the situation or something similar to it with uh, other clients. Finding a time where you can sit down with both of them so that you're not creating a, a gossipy situation. You know what I mean? Sit down with both of them and let them know. And it's very difficult to do this. I understand. Totally let down your guard and tell them I want, you know, I, I, I asked you two to come here today because I have something that's been bothering me and I need your help. Like that may be my lead in line. I have something that's been bothering me and I need your help. And I would use a script because if you do not use a script, it tends to go off on tangents. Your conversation would. So the script that I recommend is a duct tape script. Speaking of duct tape scripts, would be like a D E S C desk. D for describe the situation. E describe the effects of the situation. Like the the when I say the D, like describe exactly what it is that happened. E how did that affect you or somebody else? S say what you would like to happen. And then C, consequences, good or bad. Have your lead in line, your closing line. Those two lines you want to have down, pat, because or else we tend to stammer and stutter and nothing good comes of that. So for example, hey guys, I brought you here today because I have been, uh, I've been struggling lately and I need your help. I introduced you to six months ago as two of my best friends and I wanted you to be friends. And since then, I feel as though, and I'm not saying it is a fact, I feel as though you two are not better friends with each other than you are with me, and I'm feeling left out. And I know that that's not even important, and I would be glad if you were good friends. But it makes me feel bad, and I wanted to let you know that. So if that is causing you to do that on purpose, or if it's all in my head, I would appreciate that so that we can all move along and be friends in whatever capacity, but just so that we're honest with one another and I'm not harbor anything and neither is anyone else that would maybe poison this relationship. Sarah said what I had to say. <laughs> you know what I mean? Whatever it is that you think might have happened, why they're friends or whatever, have a script and that will help you keep on track. And uh, by the way, I also, that was a great example of not having a closing line handy. So if you, <laughs> now, thanks. Now, the, now the different distractions have all gone away from around me. Uh, a closing line would sound something like, Do you think we could do that? And you end there. You know what I mean? So I would start off with something like, you know, guys, lately I've been feeling bad and I wanted to talk with you about it. That might be a lead in line. You've been getting together a lot without me. And I just wanted to let you know, I feel bad about that, whether that's immature, childish or whatever. I do. And I wanted to let you know. So in the future, if there is anything that's causing you to exclude me, please let me know so that I would at least know and be able to talk about it with you. And I will continue to let you know if I feel these things, even if they're silly. Can we all agree on that? That might be you know, something that you would say, just keep it really short. One, two, three, four sentences. Here's what happened. Here's how I felt about that. Here's what I need. And here's what we could all get out of that. Do you think that would work? Could we do that? You know, as a closing line, that might help you get it out and ask them what's been going on. Because People change friends. You know, they might just be excited to know one another and they're spending a lot of time together and they don't know that you feel bad. And if you told them, that might change everything. If you told them in a very non-confrontational uh, way. <laughs> right, right. Way too touchy-feely. I know. It depends on who you're talking to. Okay. When you're not gossiping at work, you're the weird one all of a sudden. It's weird how coworkers want you to engage with them. Okay. That is one of the things, Danilo... We people, I, I do, con I do conferences on how to <laughs> cleanse a toxic work environment and addressing negative chatter at work and gossip and things like that. And it's the difficult thing about gossip really is just knowing that I'm, if I'm choosing not to be part of the gossip, chances are we'll be gossiped about. And we just have to choose. That's the difficult part, right? So it's just something that we have to know. And we have to know the people who gossip with us, with us gossip about us. But we also want to keep in mind, a lot of times people get upset with other people because they think that they're gossiping when they're not really gossiping. If, if I am, you know, talking to my mother about a friend of mine that I'm having a challenge with, it's because that's how I work through things. You know what I mean? If I'm disgusted, angry, upset, confused, Sometimes we're talking with people about other people because we need to work through issues. 
And that's how people do it. And so sometimes we take people talking about us or as gossiping and we take it too much to heart. You know, something, if it's not meant for us to hear, it's not meant for us to hear. And everybody works through things in a different way. So if you find people are gossiping about you, don't take it too much to heart. You know, anybody who's important knows <laughs> the, the truth. Um, one second. Dan, how would you address a boss who keeps challenging you on everything, even factual things like data? I'm really not sure where it's coming from. Used to be an ally. Not sure it can be fixed now. Well, Jen, I'm, you know, when you said that you're not sure if it could be fixed now, it's good that you recognize that because sometimes it's true. Maybe your boss has now seen you as a threat and they, they want to discount you in front of other people. Maybe, maybe that's, maybe they actually think it for other reasons. Maybe they found out that you gave them a bunch of erroneous data and now they're doubting everything that you say. Uh, I doubt that is true. I'm just saying, uh, if you want to address that with your boss, the way I would do it is number one in private, just like I mentioned before, I'd have a script, like, let's say, okay, if I were going to address my boss for questioning me on everything, if it were in private, the next time they did it, that's easy because then I could launch right into the script. If it's in front of other people, I would wait until you can find a moment alone to address your boss and say, you know, Trixie, I need your help. Just now, when I gave you the data you asked for, you questioned me, and that's happened more than once lately, and I've recognized it as the change in behavior. That's the D. The E might be something like, when you question me like that, it really takes away from our productivity because that's what I'm paid for, and that's what you should be counting on me for, to give you correct data when you ask for it, and I'm capable of doing that. Then I go to the C, or S, the S. What do you say? Whatever it is that caused you to have these doubts in me, you either tell me what it is or let it go so that we can both be more productive and get our jobs done more efficiently in the future. And if we can do that, I, for one, can let this go and move along in our professional relationship. Could you do that? Do you think that would work for you? Something like that. I would address it really quickly because maybe she's not aware that she's doing it. You know what I mean? Maybe she's not aware. Um, but I would, I would be very, 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 very upfront and clear and not use questions like challenge questions. You know, a challenge question would be something like, why would you ask me that? Sometimes those are good questions. You know, why would you doubt me when I give you the answer? Is there something that I have done to, you know, I, I wouldn't ask those types of questions to my boss before I was very upfront and direct and clear with the situation. Because again, it, it tends to be if, you, if this has been a long relationship and suddenly it went south, there's something probably that has nothing to do with you that you don't know about, that she's not aware, she is directing towards you. So I would bring it up very clearly so that she can be aware of it and be at least allowed to change her behavior. And that's my advice for that. <laughs> I hope that helps. Um, help, Dan. Wow. Javont, Javonta Gonzalez. However you did it, you, oh, you put five bucks in there. That's how you did it. Wow. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. I'm getting that one right on. Okay. Help Dan, girlfriend of seven years wants space and told me to move out. Oh, she doesn't know if she wants to be with me. She also, she will also have a baby. Wait a minute. We also have a baby. What should I do? What should I say? Okay. Girlfriend of seven years wants space and told me to move out. She doesn't know if she wants to be with me and she also, okay. Unfortunately, oh boy. Okay, here's my advice. In my family, my brother, myself, and I, my parents, our relationships last forever until de death does not part us. Death actually unites us even more. That said, what I have noticed in our family and the reason our relationships last forever is because I think we have to recognize that sometimes love changes form. Maybe she does not, I'm, maybe she does not see you in that way anymore as a romantic partner, life partner that way. Maybe because she met somebody else. Maybe because she's hormonal. Maybe because she's just having midlife crisis. Maybe she's going crazy. Maybe it's not 
Maybe she's testing you, whatever it is. The point I'd like to make is it, there, there are many ways to deal with that, right? You could go to counseling. You could try to win her back. You could do a lot of different things. If whatever you do, you make sure that in your relationship from now until forever, you always treat her lovingly. And if she wants to be alone, you love her while you let her be alone. And if she wants to never see you again, you love her on, from afar. You know what I mean? As long as you keep loving her in a, and are loving to her, love changes form, but the substance, if you take care of it, will always be there. And even if it's a difficult transition, I'm not saying that you're, you know, need to transition. She might snap out of it. Whatever happens doesn't matter. What matters is that you recognize the love that has been given to you to take care of with her and your daughter, I believe, or just, you have a baby. And as long as no matter what you do, you think, if I have to leave you, I'm going to leave you in a loving way. If I have to divorce you, I'm going to divorce you in a loving way. And if we have to Whatever we have to do, I'm going to love you, period, because that's how I roll. <laughs> you know, that's what our relationship is, and it's been given to me to take care of. If you do that, there's no way you can lose, because if there's a situation going on with her that you can't do anything about, which happens sometimes, and men tend to feel very powerless, you know, like, I need to do something, I need to fix that, when we can't. And if, if that is the case and you maintain your loving stance, she will recognize that and come back to you. Do not hold on to any particular form. You know, if she stays with you or comes back to you, it might not be as a girlfriend or a wife. It might be as your best friend. It might be as uh, your many different things. Do not hold on to form because that's guaranteed to change. The substance, however, wasn't ours to begin with and we can't change it, but we can take care of it. So that's that's all I that's all I can really say there. And you can't go wrong. Just maintain the love in that relationship. Doesn't matter what form it's in. And let her say and be whatever she wants and know that you'll love her through that. Oh my god. I mean, I've seen love transition out of uh out of romance into friendship and it's so much more fulfilling for both of the people and so much more appropriate at you know different stages and it's just if you let it be whatever it is but maintain the love you just will you can't go wrong you, and your life will be filled with love forever okay hold on thanks jen um for the five better yourself <laughs> dan help us to create a personal compass for dealing with haters sure uh personal compass and by the way, I apologize if I'm missing some of your comments. I, uh, as you can see, I'm <laughs> challenged haters. A personal compass really, that, that's the whole thing about a personal compass is it doesn't change depending on whether you're with haters or lovers. Um, a personal compass has three parts to it. So you want to fill in the blanks in these three questions. I am blank. Use adjectives, one word adjectives. Not like I'm the bomb <laughs> or, you know, I'm, I'm it's like, I'm compassionate and I am loving. Uh, I am, um, well, for example, in, in my personal compass, I put, <laughs> I am, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting what I put in my personal compass. I use it, I have it, I have it written down right in front of me somewhere in here, but I am compassionate. I'm loving. That was one of the first things I put in there. Then number two, I'm here to, like, what are you here to do Not on the planet that will not change ever, no matter where you are? I'm here to learn. I'm here to, like, for example, I'm here to learn lessons, not teach them. I'm here to enjoy myself. That was number one. I'm here to shine light into the darkness. If that's what you feel like you're, you know, if some people feel they have a mission, so stick to it. And step number three is I want, what do you want? Most people cannot f finish that sentence when you ask them, Hey, what do you want out of life? You know, what, what do you want? <laughs> people, most people will, uh, or excuse me, one of those there's, I know who I am, I know why I'm here, and I know what I want. So, for example, I am Dale O'Connor. I'm here to learn, love, and I want financial independence. I put that on my personal compass, number one, because I know that that's going to 
be a key in anything that I do, you know, as long as I can not feel financially enslaved, then I will feel free to make decisions based on strength and how what I say at work is going to be based on other things rather than needing that paycheck at the end of the week. That's what you need to do. You need to fill in those three sentences. I am, I'm here too, and I want. Then what will happen is when you find yourself dealing with haters or dealing with difficult situations or dealing with, you know, narcissist bosses or coworkers who are rude or whatever the situation is, in that sliver in time before you speak in those situations, when you want to teach them a lesson or you want to uh, show them that you can be the nastiest communicator at work or you, you know, when you want to finally tell your mom off <laughs> or whatever it may be, you'll stop and you'll be like, wait a minute. I wrote down that I'm a loving person or I'm a patient person. I want financial independence and I'm here to learn. What I'm wanting to say has nothing to, that's not in line with any of that. So even though at this moment, I really think you need to hear it, I'm going to trust the sane and sober Dan that wrote this note to myself. And it, you know, wrote, that's what, that's what a personal compass does is it says to your future self, hey, when your brain chemicals are causing you to go absolutely crazy, I'm sane and sober right now and I'm telling you, this is what you really want and who you are and what you are really here to do. And so you remind yourself of that because, you know, you can really transcend time with love. And that's one of the loving, most loving things you can do is try to help yourself be who you are when you're forgetting it so that you can be a more loving, compassionate person. You will stop during those moments in time and you will change what you were going to say into something else and think, you know, maybe you won't say anything. Maybe like I've, I've remembered at times very recently <laughs> where I'm about to say something to my mother and I think that's not in line with what I, that's, that's not it. You know, that's my ego wanting to speak. I'm going to give it a few minutes and remember my personal compass. And so I'll choose kindness or compassion with my mother. Even if you do that one time, it's totally worth all of the time that you've spent making that personal compass, totally worth it. And it creates turning points because a, when, when you stop a pattern in your life of reacting to things in a certain way out of ego, you know, and, you're cruel to me. I'll be cruel back to you. You know, you treat me with lovelessness. I will show you the depths of lovelessness and how deep I can go. You know, when we think of these crazy thoughts, uh, when you can stop and you choose differently, because that's really, we're all about cycles and we might have a few turning points. A personal compass helps you create a turning point. And when you do that, it's that miraculous instant is that moment between event and response where you choose differently and it changes the trajectory of your entire life because chances are what you will do is you will choose from a place of love and that changes everything. You know what I mean? When you go from lovelessness to compassion, which is generally what you will find will happen as you use a personal compass, it changes everything and that's, that's it's a miracle. Okay, sorry. I get, I get a little bit off on tangents. I can't see anymore. <laughs> okay, for character jumping. Wow, th wow! Just me, Joe. Holy crap. Well, thanks, Joe. For character jumping in the air in front of a big red heart with pom-pom in their hands. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have given many skills. I don't know. I'm here. Yes, that's it, Melanie. I am. Oh, for example, but like the example, a lot of people... <laughs> <laughs> when I'm doing this in a group, a lot of people will say, I am, you know, I'm the bomb <laughs> in front of the, you know, the I am or I am whatever. I'm, I'm a sexy mama. And that's, that's my brother put that. Uh, remember that it's adjectives that you want to, or like I'll ask people, here's what I'll, here's what I'll do. I'll say, what type of a mother do you want to be? What type of a father do you want to be? And people will say things like, well, I want to be a good father. Well, what does that mean? You know, I want to be, a, I want to be the best father. What does that mean? I want to be patient. You know, when I, when I need to be, I want to be loving. I want to be whatever. So those are the words you really want to focus on that will apply to any situation. You know, and who, why am I here? Uh, it's, if I had to wake up in the morning and think I was going to do a communication training coaching session, and that was my purpose in life, I would throw myself in my koi pond smothered in, <laughs> what worms, but thank goodness. Hopefully we all have sometimes it's clearer than other, a, a reason why we are here. And if I'm driving a bus today, that might be the vehicle that I'm using 
to do what I'm here to do. But the more we can remind ourselves, no, I'm here to do something. And it is in, as we all know, it is always in the most inconspicuous, seemingly mundane of moments where we have those turning points or we look back and we think that could have been a turning point. It's those moments that we do not recognize at all until, retro, except for in retrospect, that are the ones that are the most important ones generally in our life. That's why we want to have a, a personal compass around constantly so that we can increase the odds that during these you know, miraculous turning points that present themselves to us, we can take advantage of them and maybe get it right once and be kind to my mother. You know, that's, that's, it's worth it. You know, kind to your son or child, you know, whatever, or find two lenses at the same time. Okay, hold on. Um, screw it, bad <laughs> message apparently. <laughs> okay, hold on. <coughs> sure, Catherine, we'd like more advice for being more assertive. I'm working through one of your books. Oh, thank you very much. Great, I'm glad you are. Okay, Catherine, for being more assertive, I think the key is, first of all, to decide, like we were just doing, what it is that you want, because most people cannot tell you off the drop, you know, at the drop of a hat, if you were to ask them, you know, hey, what do you want? What are you here? What are you here for? They, they're not used to thinking about it. So it, you know, that escapes them in the moments that are necessary. But I, it, if you want to be more assertive consistently, generally the people I'm telling you, Catherine, who, ex who experience, who struggle with that, it's because they want to be nice. They are people pleasers. And then they wake up one day and find that they have let themselves down uh, and they feel bad about that. You know, like I've left myself out and that hurts just as much as someone else leaving us out because it's really the one relationship. So I recommend if that is the case, when you are being assertive, be very clear that being assertive is not being a bossy boss. It's not being bossy. It's not being, hey, you know, I'm, no, you shut up and listen to me. You know, it's not about that. When we see people who we consider to be very assertive, sometimes we ourselves confuse assertive behavior with aggressive behavior. And if you're struggling with being assertive, just remember, you can be assertive while at the same time, in fact, it is the most perfect way to be assertive, being as loving as you have ever been in your whole life. Because assertive behavior is behavior that honors the other person while honoring yourself and everyone else and the maker that brought you here at the same time, because it's just one relationship. And so when I'm standing up for my needs or your needs or whatever I think is right, whatever that is, I don't need to do that in, a, in an aggressive way. I don't need to do that in a way that is rubbing anyone the wrong way or offends them. If somebody is rubbed the wrong way or whatever, that is not my issue. That's not about me. I don't need to think about that or worry about that because if I'm doing it in the most, I keep going back to being loving and I, it, it's true, whether I'm at work or at home, it doesn't matter. That's where strength comes from. If I'm being a compassionate, loving person while I'm standing up for what it is that I need to stand up for, that is the most powerful thing you can do. And it tends to reconcile that in people's minds when they really get that, when they recognize it. You know, I thought being assertive was kind of, you know, having to st stomp on other people or push, push other people aside so that I can be in the front of the line for once. And that's not it. So keep that in mind while you are practicing saying things, you know, be like, you know, telling, stopping people from interrupting you while you're standing up for your own needs. There's nothing I have to say that I can't say in a loving way. Nothing. If I can't figure out how to say it in a loving way that is honoring me and you, then I don't need to say it right now, or I'm not thinking straight because there's nothing that needs to be said that I can't say that way. So keep that in mind because that will probably liberate you. And, you know, if you can kind of turn that key and, and see that and be like, that's right. What is stopping me? Because the more assertive I am, the more... I'm loving to you and me and everyone else. And I'm showing everybody else how to love themselves. So there won't be any more conflict. Uh, and then from then on, it's just practicing the words, you know, having your scripts and your tactics, because the patterns that we tend to use, if we are not assertive and we are letting ourselves down and leaving ourselves out, those are patterns, you know, and just like any other language pattern, if I'm you know, speaking English today and I need to speak 
Spanish in 20 minutes. It's just a shift in patterns, but you have to practice them and get them in there first. So practice them and, and recognize what being assertive really is. And it's just being clear and direct with your communication while you honor everybody involved. Okay. <laughs> I got to put those away. Okay, hold on. Okay. That's me. Is that you, Val? <laughs> I like the broken. Okay, Morgan, I have to tell you, the broken record and things like, for example, uh, we just talked about how you how to kind of, how can I be more assertive. The broken record coupled with the, for example, that may be but is one of my favorite tactics that I talk about in so many situations because people will always ask me, even though they've, let's say that they've been to all of my conferences and read my books and done my programs, they will still come up and say, you know, Dan, later on tonight, I, I'm dealing with a contractor at my house who I need to tell him that he needs to change something that he just installed because he did it wrong. And I know he's going to fight with me and I know he's going to, it's going to be a problem. How do I deal with that? And it's usually the very simplest things, you know, just give them the, that may be, but and the broken record, you know, Hey Joe, that entertainment center needs to be redone. Wait a minute. That's, that's the way I was told to do it. Well, that may be, but that needs to be redone. Well, but wait a minute. That's that's. If you look at the plans, it's exactly the way I was supposed to be doing it. That may be, but it needs to be redone. Well, but if you do that, you know, it's it's going to just ruin the whole project. That may be, but it needs to be redone. You know, so you just use the that may be, but and then repeat yourself using the broken record. It's so simple, but it's super effective, right? <laughs> Somebody just said that. It's one of my favorite things because it doesn't need to be complicated for it to be the perfect tactic for the job. And frequently, it's the simplest ones that are the perfect ones. And again. For example, if we were just talking about being assertive and how to do that, that showing somebody, well, that may be, but it's going to be redone. That may be, but it's going to be redone. That may be, that is loving because what I'm doing is I'm showing you how a person who loves himself honors himself in his pocketbook by making sure that I get what I pay for. You know, that's totally loving. And if you would like to emulate that, you're free to have it. See, I mean, I'm being loving and generous at the same time. And it's true. So it doesn't need to be nasty. You know, it doesn't need to be complicated. So just make sure that you do it and you recognize I'm doing you a favor when I'm assertive with you. I'm literally doing you a favor. Okay. <laughs> you acknowledged me. That's the first. Val, that's the first time. <laughs> it's the first that I've acknowledged you. Okay. I, I use it with the kid. I said I can't do. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Uh, <coughs> our kids are some of our best master teachers when it comes to communication skills because that's where we can, that's where most of us actually learn. You know, wait a minute, you, because kids are masters. Right from the get-go, they recognize, they're kind of like dogs. You know, dogs pick up on the littlest things and tend to have ES, people believe, like I believe it, that my dogs, you know, have ESP. They don't really have ESP. They just know this means that. That leads to that. And that's, you know, that's what they know. And kids learn that same thing. And, but we go through an unlearning process after we are adults, or once we become adults. And we, we forget all of, we don't forget, we unlearn all of these things that we were naturally born with. You know, like if I'm just loving, you know, my natural state is to love and, and to receive and give love and get all my needs met. At the same time, I can do that until we become older and forget that and unlearn that. But our kids, for example, learn that if they just, if they just keep trying to, excuse me, our kids learn that if we change our tune, you know, like if I say, Eamon, I'm picking you up from this party at 1230, so be ready. Uncle Dan, I'll make friends get a home at one. And I'll be like, well, your friends are, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of troublemakers. Oh, what do you mean troublemakers? They come from good families. You, you hang out with their mom. Well, she's, you know, she's, she's kind of loose, you know, <laughs> whatever. If I start to argue, if I start to argue with my nephew, he will recognize I've got him on the run and he'll keep going and going, you know, try to get me. You know what I mean? Because they recognize that's the cue. I got him to change what he said a moment ago. So I'm, I'm, I'm pursuing this because I'm not winning. But if we instead say to our kids, hey, I'm going to pick you up at 1230. My friend's going to get picked up at one. Well, that may be, but I'm picking you up at 1230. Well, you can stay up till two. Well, that may be, but I'm picking you up at 1230. You know, they tend to learn by the third time. <laughs> but I'm not saying that for you. I'm saying that for me. So uh, just, <laughs> just 
<laughs> kids are our master teachers. Practice with them, you know, because they help us develop so many different skills. Uh, we have to recognize our master teachers when we see them. Okay, Morgan, after doing it a few times, I don't have to repeat myself so much. It works, right? It's true. When you when you start to use the bro, and there's, you know what that plateau is when you're a parent, where all of a sudden your kids are like, rats, I can't wear them down, you know, because you learn, it's not that the kids learn, you learn to take control and be like, I'm just gonna use the broken record now. And they learn right away, rats, you know, by the second time, they just know, I know where this is going, it's just gonna be the same, they're gonna keep repeating themselves, so I'm just gonna accept it and move along and go ask dad, you know, so they, we train people how to treat us, and that's always true. And what gets rewarded gets repeated. As I'm training people to treat me, I have to remember that. First of all, the only way that people treat me is how I allow them to treat me or teach them to treat me, train them to treat me. And I train them by rewarding behavior. What gets rewarded gets repeated. What does not get rewarded will eventually not get repeated. So those are general, general rules of, of communication. And it doesn't, it doesn't work for me. My oldest does what she wants. And, and then I get mad. Oh, that's when they listen. When you get mad. Really? Val? Val? I recognize that cat. Oh, hi, Jorge. <laughs> Speaking of loving, Jorge is one of the, uh, Jorge is one of the most loving people that I know. And I'm glad that you are here. And I have to apologize, Jorge, now that I can, now that I've finally said hello to you, it is time for me to, I'm turning into a pumpkin. And I wanted to make sure I'm going to try to go through your comments here and answer them, even if it's, you know, later on today in a, in short ones, or even if it's on a chat personal level, if you, uh, if you have a question that you were hoping that I would answer that I didn't get a chance to, I apologize, please send me an email or write it in here and tell, let me know that it's important. And I will answer that for you so that you aren't just left hanging. Cause I know what that feels like. Uh, so I'm going to go over to my mom's now and maybe, uh, Maybe, maybe you'll get a double dose of advice. But I don't know if you're still there, Mart. Uh, if you are, thank you for being there and helping me with, uh, with help calling me and letting me know that the sound didn't work. And thank you, Jorge, for always being there. And uh, remember, everybody, if you're with people that you love, that is a blessing. So love them and speak loving words to them, and you will never regret it. And if you have any challenges doing that, that's why I'm here. So let me know and I can help. For everyone here at Dan O'Connor Training, Buddy and Mags have gone. <laughs> so that's what that was their that was their sign that they said to me that they have had enough of this. So for everyone else, that's just me signing off. Have a happy holiday season, and I will be putting up more videos shortly. So please stay tuned and subscribe and put on that notification bell. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye.